all in and around the Surrey and southeast of London. Well, many of his victims noticed how softly spoken he was and how obsessively he seemed to cover up his mouth. The reasons why would only become clear once he was in custody. Matthew has this exclusive story of how police finally caught the night stalker. For nearly two decades, this man terrorised the elderly residents of South East London, silently breaking into their homes to rob and sexually assault them in terrifying attacks that could last for hours. The media named him uh, the Night Stalker, and that very simply because at late at night he would be creeping around the houses and back gardens uh, of homes in South East London and breaking into those occupied by single elderly people. What followed would become one of the largest and most controversial investigations this country has ever seen. But it would take 17 years of gruelling detective work before they finally caught their man. He was Delroy Grant, a married father of 10 who last week was found guilty of 29 counts of indecently assaulting, raping and robbing pensioners. The actual number of victims is thought to be much higher. We have 203 offences linked by the time of his arrest, but the truth is there are probably more victims who firstly never came forward, and secondly, if they did, they would not always tell us the full extent of the crimes they suffered. This is the story of how detectives unmasked Britain's most prolific sex attacker and finally called the Night Stalker. I became the senior investigating officer, or SIO, in 2001. My first impressions were uh, quite daunting. By the time I arrived, there were 73 offences already linked by a variety of methods. All the offences that we're talking about are in um, the distinct areas of South East London uh, and just over the border into Surrey. The Night Stalker had first come onto the police's radar in 1992 when he brutally raped an 89-year-old woman at her home in Shirley in south-east London. DNA was recovered from the scene, but no match was found on the National DNA Database. Then, six years later, he struck again, attempting to rape another elderly woman, this time in Wallingham in Surrey, just seven miles from his first attack. DNA from the second assault confirmed that police had a serial sexual predator on their hands. A special investigation was set up called Operation Minstead. His MO was extremely unique. It was almost like his signature. He would attack the house uh, normally by removing a window in one piece, very careful and meticulous in this approach. Once inside or just outside, he would target the electricity by turning it off at the mains and removing fuses. He would cut the telephone wire. He would then go round the house, unscrewing light bulbs, and eventually, and quite unlike most burglars, he would then go and interact with the elderly victim. The victims would only realize there was someone in their home when they were woken in their beds by a blinding torch shining in their faces. They were then put through terrifying ordeals which could last for several hours. We found potential victims that were sleeping during the day so that they could stay awake at night and be aware and respond to any noise that they feared may be him. For someone to prey on the elderly and for them not to have peace and comfort in the latter years of their life, just horrendous. The first challenge detectives faced was to identify potential suspects. If I put you in the position of a victim, you're in your 80s and you're in your bed, you're safe and you're woken in the middle of the night by a hand over your mouth and immediately there will be a demand for sex. You reach for the light to turn, to turn it on and nothing happens because he's already disabled the electrics. He shines a torch in your eyes and he's wearing a balaclava. You're petrified and I'm going to ask you now, describe him to me. It's impossible, you just can't. With only a vague description of a black male aged between 35 and 45 from South East London to go on, detectives called on behavioural profilers to help piece together a picture 
of who this man could be. The way he behaved inside the victims' homes was very revealing. It was clear he had experience with the elderly from the way he supported and lifted his victims, leading profilers to believe he'd worked as a carer or in an elderly care home. And in order to creep about without arousing suspicion, it was suggested he worked at night. Well, it was a late one last night, was it? Yeah, it was a bit. Oh, I feel like Bye, Bye, see ya. And there was something else that was bothering Detective Superintendent Morgan. The lengths this man was going to, to hide his face. For me, it was a potential that there was something different about his face, something readily identifiable about his facial features. The problem was we didn't know exactly what that was. By 1999, the frequency and severity of the attacks had escalated. In August of that year, he carried out his most violent attack yet, raping an 89-year-old woman. Twice. The assault was so brutal, the victim was left fighting for her life. It's very impactive. Um, it, it, it's very sad, and uh, you know, uh, we needed no more motivation to find this man. But police were still struggling to narrow down their pool of 16,000 potential suspects. So they turned to the public for help. A massive investigation has been launched by police in London to catch a man responsible for a series of sex attacks on elderly women. The appeal had unexpected results. They stopped him. It's as simple as that. He followed the press and what was being said about him, and he would stop offending. And for three years it worked, but in 2002 he surfaced again, indecently assaulting an elderly woman in the same area of London where he'd attacked his first victim ten years earlier. So instead of another appeal, a large-scale surveillance operation was set up involving over a hundred police officers. Surveillance teams waited for the attacker to walk into their trap. During the sixth week of the operation, a violent burglary took place, which bore all the hallmarks of having been committed by the Night Stalker. But frustratingly for police, it was a mile outside of their surveillance cordon. Absolutely devastating. We've invested um, uh, an immense amount of uh, proactive resources to covering a favoured area, and he switches to an area that he'd never been at before. But detectives were undeterred. The one thing we knew that we definitely had 100% was this man's DNA. So we approached this with a view to keeping up with the developing world of science. In 2003, another Metropolitan Police investigation had used a pioneering scientific technique called ancestral DNA profiling to identify the ethnicity of a headless torso been found floating in the River Thames. If they could apply the same technique to the Night Stalker's DNA, they would have a far more accurate picture of his ethnic background. The DNA samples were sent to America, where scientists got to work. Two weeks later, they had a result. What it told us from the analysis of his DNA is that his ancestry is from the Caribbean. Now, this enabled us to rule out anyone that was solely of African ancestry or anyone who had a white parent or grandparent. Within just a few weeks, the number of potential suspects had been drastically reduced. The fact that we removed several thousand, literally overnight, really boosted morale. We really thought we were getting closer to him. By 2007, Detectives could see that the offender's behaviour was changing. The motivation appeared to be mainly for money. It was clear that the level of um, precautions that he had been taking in the planning of the offences was reducing. He was becoming greedy. Once again, surveillance teams were set up all over Shirley in south-east London. Then, on the 29th of October 2009, a man matching the offender's description 
was caught on CCTV running to a car from the scene of a nearby burglary. I looked at the picture and you could barely make out a, a blurry image of a vehicle. It meant nothing to me, so we engaged a expert who immediately told us the make and model of the vehicle. It was a Vauxhall Severa B model, 2005 to 2009. After nearly two decades, they felt they were closer than ever to finally catching the culprit. 17 days later, on a cold November night, one of the surveillance teams noticed a similar Vauxhall Sephira parked on a residential road in Shirley. We have a grey Vauxhall Sephira parked on the road. Over. Then, an hour later, a man was spotted running to the car. Officers sprung into action. two-year-old married father of ten, Delroy Grant. At the station, Grant denied all knowledge of his crimes, speaking only to confirm his personal details. Okay, what's your first name, please? Delroy. But detectives were confident they had their man. He matched very accurately what we thought we knew about him. He is a primary carer for his disabled wife, who has multiple sclerosis. He has a history of working in old people's homes. We know that he was out working at night, often as a minicab driver. Where's Chloe then? His family and friends that we've spoken to are absolutely shocked that this is him. Um, he was outwardly Mr. Ordinary. He clearly lived two lives and he kept his two lives separate. Nobody knew he was the man that was out raping. Uh, the elderly. And there was more. Well, I went straight into work uh, and went down to the custody suite to meet him. Uh, clearly I've waited a long time for that moment. I also wanted to know what was the reason why he'd taken such precaution to hide his face from the victims. He has no front teeth and he doesn't wear dentures. And that would have been something that if a victim had noted um, we would have probably and highly likely caught him a lot earlier. Samples of Grant's DNA were taken and rushed to the Forensic Science Service for analysis. Eight hours later, Detective Superintendent Morgan got the call. Excellent. Thanks. He was a one in a billion match. Uh, it was him. This month, Grant stood trial at Woolwich Crown Court. Despite the overwhelming evidence against him, he pleaded not guilty. His defence in court was that his wife from the 1970s had stored um, various samples of his body fluids and over the subsequent 31 year period out of malice had um, deposited them at the scenes of crime. Um, quite frankly, a ludicrous um, defence and if it wasn't so sad, it would be laughable. The jury found Grant guilty of all charges. He was given a life sentence and ordered to serve a minimum of 27 years. Personally, I've waited 10 years for this verdict. For years, many of his victims, all they wanted to know was who was he and why did he attack them? Sadly, most of them have gone to their graves not knowing the answers to those questions. His victims have shown courage and strength when faced with the most frightening of situations. 
these are traits that Delroy Grant does not possess. He is now rightly where he belongs. The elderly, the vulnerable, it's beyond horror, that really. Yeah, it doesn't get much worse. These were frail pensioners, often blind or deaf, with Parkinson's or Alzheimer's that he deliberately targeted. The judge told him, your utter depravity knows no bounds. You left a trail of distress, fear and misery from Delroy Grant no explanation, absolutely no remorse. Quite the opposite. You heard that defence about yeah. his ex-wife. I mean, it was preposterous. And um, there's no doubt about it. He should have been caught earlier. Yes, in 1999, he was spotted acting suspiciously near one of the burglaries. Someone phoned in his car registration, and that gave police a name, Delroy Grant. But they investigated the wrong Delroy Grant. They took his DNA. It didn't match, and so that name was ruled out of the police inquiries. They did go around to the right Delroy Grant's house, but he was out and they didn't go back. The Independent Police Complaints Commission described it as a simple misunderstanding that had horrific consequences because Grant committed at least another 146 attacks and after the trial, police publicly apologised for that mistake. Uh, it was a, a massive police operation in terms of the logistics of it, the span of it. It was massive with some blind alleys as well like whether he used a motorbike to get to the crimes the police put out this EFIT at the time. But in the end, it was a return to that strategy of focusing on the robberies that was the absolute key. When they caught Grant, his car was packed with all of the paraphernalia for the break-ins, which had spiked in 2008 because he'd gone into severe financial difficulties. And so they reset that surveillance trap. Uh, and can it be right, possibly hundreds more victims, briefly? Yeah, 203 linked to him. The police say it will be more. One woman told police that her mum had told the police about the burglary but just couldn't bring herself to say that she'd been raped as well. And she died before Grant was caught and tragically so many of the victims did. I mean, from beginning to end, this is a horrific story with only one redeeming feature that he's been caught and probably will never get out of prison. It's Matthew Love. Love has got more of his wanted faces around.